independent candidate uh, running for U.S. Senate in 2024. And today is April 28th, 2023. Uh, we are convening this uh, dialogue tonight in the middle of an extremely alarming crisis, uh, as people know who had the opportunity to tune in or be present at my Saturday town hall meeting with Helga Tsepp LaRouche, moderated very ably by Tara Reid, Scott Ritter, uh, many other people, Steve Starr, the expert on what nuclear Armageddon looks like. Uh, Helga stressed that she, Steve Starr, and Scott were very adamant on the threat of thermonuclear war. This is not because of Russia, but because of the complete insanity, the unhinged insanity of the leaders of the West, fueled in large part by the blowout of the quadrillions of dollars worth of the derivatives and everything bubble, if you want to call it that. Now, uh, as people have heard, more and more nations are getting off of the transatlantic Titanic, uh, leaving the dollar as the world's currency, moving to other currencies with good reason. But the question is, how do you organize the recovery? What role could the United States play in such a recovery? And I think uh, that's what we want to take up tonight. Now, before I get to that, I just want to touch on a couple of other matters of, of great importance. One is that we have the continuing crackdown on free speech. Last week at this time, we had just learned of the African People's Socialist Party members being indicted uh, allegedly for um, recruiting people to be agents of Russian influence and quote unquote, sowing discord in a nation that is supposed to be free and protect freedom of speech. Why is sowing discord? You're supposed to be allowed to express disagreement with the government or with official narratives. And then we had later Tucker Carlson's removal from Fox News, he being one of the very few, if only, mainstream media personalities who took up this war danger and who presented a more even-handed and accurate view of the crisis we are facing, unlike the shriekers about Putin uh, and and people who say that the Nord Stream pipelines were blown up by a group of people on a rowboat <laughs> coming somewhere from some port who probably got their explosives delivered by a Chinese weather balloon. Um, you know, it's it's really a very sad day when it is virtually impossible for the average person to find out the truth. And that's why the work of Lyndon LaRouche was so important because his work and he said over and over again, don't memorize facts. We don't want you to regurgitate little blobs of trivia. What we want is for people to develop a scientific method of knowing, like as Socrates or Kepler, how do you know what is true? How can you know within your own mind whether something, as they say, makes sense, coheres with natural law, or doesn't? Uh, and he wrote a paper uh, some years ago called Trade Without Currency. And my guest this evening, Richard Freeman, and some of the respondents from some of our younger members, Sam Netnan and Simon Miller, uh, will be discussing this paper, what happens at the end of the dollar system, uh, what Americans and others need to know, and is there hope for the United States, and is there a need, I would say, for the United States to play a particular role in this crisis? So with that, let me introduce Rich Freeman, who is a longtime collaborator of LaRouche, a writer for Executive Intelligence Review, and a good friend. So Rich, please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Diane. Um, just to tell people, we um, had a discussion last night on the fireside chat of some of this, um, and people may want to go there 
And I would also say that uh, you can write in and get this paper, which I've been urging everybody to uh, read. It's called The Hard Basket of Commodities, Trade Without Currency. It's one of the most important papers um, that you could possibly look at. Um, I would say that in terms of the uh, de-dollarization, which I'll mention in a second, uh, Lyndon LaRouche, in writing this paper, which was written in 2000, um, actually had a conception of what uh, this process would be. He actually looked at the problem that we might be moving off the dollar, and he, but he did it from a very, very high standpoint. Just to reference what Diana said, um, numbers of currencies, last month, China traded more in yuan in cross-border trade than it did in dollars. That's a first, and it just gives you an indication, and about $430 billion. Um, It gives you an indication of the process which is now underway. People are leaving the dollar, largely because at this point, it, it's always had a problem, but the United States has placed sanctions or on the dollar, and so therefore anyone who trades in it is uh, subject to arbitrary and impulsive American sanctions. The interesting question about this trade without the currency paper is, and I would just say that uh, people have seen that there are banks failing, Credit Suisse being absorbed by Bank of uh, Union Bank of Switzerland, UBS, and the government of Switzerland and the central bank put up $280 billion to back this up. You have to ask yourself the question, why would someone put up a quarter of a trillion dollars or more to do that? There's a very important truth in that, which is that the financial system is falling apart. When LaRouche wrote this, it was in July 18th of 2000, he was looking at a similar process, not as far as advanced, um, in which various uh, speculative instruments were being used. And there was a uh, crisis in Asia in 97, 98, uh, by people trying to destroy the currencies of Asia. Russia had the blowout of its uh, debt, its bonds in 1998 and going on to 1999. And so he looked at this. What you confront with this, and I will answer a question that I know I mean, anticipate coming in, on what is a fixed exchange rate system? I, I have to tell you that it was back in 1971 when uh, Richard Nixon, then president, took the dollar off the gold exchange system when we ended the fixed exchange sy uh, rate system. So that's 52 years ago. It's a long time. Most people on this call may not have been even born then, and uh, it, it means that they don't really know what a fixed exchange rate system is. So I'll try and explain that. In this paper, LaRouche says, OK, we can't use the Bretton Woods system, uh, even in its impoverished form after we took it apart in 1971 that existed in 1997, 1999, 2000. So we're going to go in a different direction. What direction? Well, we're going to try and find something, an, an element of value that we could base trade on because we have to trade. We want, to, we want to sell goods across borders for various, very, very good reasons. Machines that we don't produce, we can import. Food that we don't produce, we can import. Things that we pr produce, we can export. So you have to have trade. You want a very vibrant trade. And if we're going to develop the world, we're going to be shipping all sorts of goods to Africa, to Asia, and so forth. What's your basis for pairing the currencies against one another? Now, that's called the fixed exchange rate system. Some people may not know what that means. It means that every currency in the world has a relationship to every other currency. So just to give you an example, a U.S. dollar will buy you 82 Indian rupees. It's 136 Japanese yen, 6.91 Chinese yuan, 462 Nigerian naira. Why do you want to know that? Well, if you're setting up a contract and you're an exporter in the United States to Nigeria, and you have sent it so that that's the exchange rate, but under a floating rate exchange system, it can go up or down very violently. It can go to 600 naira, 1,000 naira, 300 naira. So it floats. Well, we want to keep it so that if you do a contract now in six months, the price that you think you're going to be paid in Naira will be say, the same price. And you also don't want currencies to be speculated against and be destroyed. That's been tried against Russia many times by trying to destroy the rupee. So you have to have some value. 
Well, what do you peg all these currencies to? It's called pegging, parity, cross fixed exchange rates. There are different names, but the means are all pegged and they're fixed. And you can make adjustments, but they're generally fixed. And you have to consult people at the international community to make the adjustments. Well, what's the basis? Well, there are various options that have been thrown out. Well, why don't we make it a basket of currencies? We have one currency that's against the basket of currencies. LaRouche says that's not going to work, and there are many reasons why. Well, why don't we make it floating exchange rate system? Because it's a total disaster, and since 1971, it opened the door to speculation. Well, why don't we make it just some arbitrary things like steel, a, a ton of steel and three potatoes and two lumps of coal? It doesn't make any sense. So what is the value? And in this paper, LaRouche discusses what is the value against which you peg all the currencies. Once you peg them, you try and keep them fixed for the reasons I've just mentioned, because we want to have an explosion of world trade under a new world economic order. And he says, well, we're not going to have one currency we peg it to. We're not going to peg it to the, to the dollar. And I don't think the Chinese want the whole world trade can done in, 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 in yuan or their international name for the yuan is renminbi. It's just too much of an, ex of an exposure and too much responsibility. So we'll peg it to a synthetic unit. It'll be, it's called a, a, a count, a, a, a trade unit of account. Well, how do we set it? W what's our standard? Well, what LaRouche says is we're going to use a basket of currencies. Now, most people misinterpret, I believe, what that means. What he says in the paper, and I think we, we went through some of the quotes on Thursday, we can provide people with those quotes, but he says it has to be pegged, I believe, to the market baskets of a household market basket, an industrial market basket, an infrastructure market basket. And the fourth one is an agricultural market basket because labor, it, the farm community reproduces and produces and reproduces itself in a different way than the industrial workforce. But we'll work with those four, concentrating on those three. What does it mean to have a market basket? Well, this gets us to the concept of potential relative population density. But let me just mention what that means. If you want to raise a household, you just cannot say, well, let them eat whatever they eat. What, you know, if we, if we feed them uh, scraps from a table, they'll, they'll live. If you want to produce a modern industrial workforce, with cognitive power to take responsibility for the future. They have to have housing. They have to have a certain level of food. They have to have transport. They have to have the ability for their children to be supported till 20 to 25 to th even 27, if they're gonna be a doctor, an engineer, or a school, skilled mechanic. They have to have culture. The child should be able to have a, a, a music lesson. The child should be able to go to an astronomy class. All those things have to be figured into what the wage should be. It's a basket. It's a coherent form of basket. Same thing for industry. You need certain types of capital goods, electricity. You need all those sorts of things. Infrastructure. We need the highest level of infrastructure. Those are three baskets. They're not just thrown together. They're organized. What LaRouche suggests is setting the currency to each country's basket of currencies not currency, but industrial or agricultural or infrastructural or um, capital goods basket. You might say how, and I'll say one in a second. Those baskets, however, are not arbitrary themselves. They are to raise a workforce and a productive process that can achieve the highest level of development, constantly going to a higher manifold of development, constantly going against entropy, the tendency to run down and be destroyed, to higher and higher levels of non-entropy, anti-entropy. That he gave the name of potential relative population density. And what I mentioned is that this is a concept of LaRouche. This is on the same order as Nicholas of Cousa's coincidence of opposites. It's on the same order as Kepler's discovery of the universe, of the a solar system, as a harmonic one, which no one had done before him. It's on the same order as the 
uh, idea of least action of Pierre Fermat and, and, and Leibniz. It is one of the highest laws of the universe. I will then just say now one or two words about that and then conclude with what a unit of account is. The point about that is that think of how you develop any country. How much population can you support on any area of land? Okay, that's population density. But the land may be full of rocks. The land may be having a swamp. The land may be having no water and no water within 100 miles, except for when it rains. The land could have all these qualities. But we have developed mankind over two, you know, about 5,000 years of civilized development. Answers for that. We know how to irrigate. We know how to drain swamps. We know how to fertilize. We know how to use the most modern uh, fact, uh, equipment of tractors, reapers, harvesters, and so forth. I'm just talking about agriculture for a moment. And so therefore, we take the land, apply man's synthetic conceptions, which is called infrastructure and technology and science, and we apply it. And suddenly that land can support much more food production, much more goods production, much more people production at a higher standard of living with greater energy consumption than they had before, which has a future of a higher level. That's called relative population density. You take the average population density and you improve it by every technology and scientific development you've had up to that time. So it's relative population density, the application of every new known means of science up to that moment. But LaRouche's concept has another word to it, potential relative population density. What happens if we make new discoveries like finally developing fusion? What happens if we take go to Mars, go to the moon, bring back helium-3 for the, both the fusion, but we also develop new things in the very process of traveling through space, new biological conceptions. What happens as one of our members, Kay Levinson, gave a few weeks ago, we develop the carbon fibers, which are eight times stronger than, than, than steel. What happens when we take superconductivity, where you've lowered the resistance so low that there's almost no resistance and electricity can flow through? Those are future ones. That's a potential. Once you apply that potential to an entire economy and society, you move it even to a higher manifold. What's the limit on potential relative population density? In the new science, the new discoveries, the new physical principles, there is none. And that's where man's mind comes in, where we develop those creative powers of the mind to make those discoveries and set up your economy so that that's where it's vectored to. So you're deploying, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of all your product to the next levels of such discovery. That's potential relative population density. That's how the human race exists and has always existed. And it was a profound, profound discovery which Mr. LaRouche started working on through 1948 through 52 and then did further work on, which produced a discovery as great as that of Kepler and others. We should therefore introduce this as a principle for the world development. There's a lot of exciting motion going on, what we call the BRICS plus, or what they call the BRICS plus. And Foreign Secretary of Russia, Lavrov, has said there's about 24 nations that are in or want to be in the BRICS. This is where the center of gravity is moving. It's moving to Asia, Africa, and elsewhere because the Western world and the United States have just proven themselves to be insane and don't want those countries to develop and want to continue neocolonialism. So that should be at the heart. And while there's many magnificent things that are being done and getting out of the dollar because of the reasons we just mentioned, you have to have a highest principle to know where you're going and what the role of man is. And that's potential relative population density. Now, how do we get from that and as the unit of value to the fixed exchange rate system. That's the last thing I want to just touch on very briefly. The point is, 
currencies are set and they are not set in stone. Uh, for example, if, if the United States one dollar can buy 136 yen, Japanese yen, that doesn't mean we're 136 times stronger than the Japanese economy. There are historical reasons why it rose that way. But we want to set currencies relatively so that the stronger ones will buy more of the weaker ones with the intention that the countries that have weaker currencies will become developed within 25 years. So there'll be no strong and no weak. So what you do is you use the market baskets that I mentioned, the producer market basket or industrial goods market basket, the household market basket, the infrastructure market basket, which is absolutely critical, all the infrastructure that you can deploy. And you figure out, Lind Lyndon LaRouche said, a synthetic price. And then you compare these synthetic prices among countries, and then you pair them to each other based on the power of those economies at this stage. It doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, you'll probably make some imperfections. But as long as you set up a fixed exchange rate system so that the currencies are not attacked and destroyed overnight by speculators, and that you can figure out if you're an exporter or importer, that if you set a contract today, it's going to be there for the next six months. You won't be ending up paying 50% more just because somebody on floating exchange rates did that. Then you bring in an international development bank like LaRouche proposed in 1975 and other variations. You bring in the capital goods, you bring in Hamiltonian credit banks in every country and an international one, and you have a mission to develop every part of the world. So the connection I just want to make is you don't have a dollar or probably not, the Chinese will not want the yuan. So you set up a, a synthetic unit. You could call it the anti-entropic unit, A, you know, a, a um, uh, E, U. And Everything gets pegged to your synthetic unit. By every currency being pegged to the synthetic unit at some strength or another, based on the productive power of each country, implicitly and officially, they're pegged to each other. If one country is three units of its currency to this synthetic unit, and another country is nine units, then the one that's three is three times stronger than the nine because three will buy nine of the others. One will buy three of the others. It's three times stronger. It doesn't mean that's set. Inside your country, you'll still use your internal currency. You're not getting rid of currencies. It's a unit of trade and it's a unit of loans so that loans can be made without fluctuation. Again, the dollar served that purpose since 1945. It's outlived that purpose. And, and I will just say one last point. The fact that the United States is clinging to a currency, which we and the city of London in particular and Wall Street have done the most to destroy. It has not been other people setting out to destroy the currency. It's look to ourselves for doing that. We will be freed from a burden and can once again return to the principles that make the economy tremendous. But guiding that is that you're setting fixed exchange rate system, not as an exercise in economics, but to have a foundation along with a dirigistic Hamiltonian international credit system, a mission to bring science and technology to every country, and to increase potential relative population density. You have a fixed exchange rate system to accomplish that. And you base it on a basket of currencies. It's trade without any one currency, but it's trade on the principle of value. So I hope that's clear, but there may be many more questions on that. Because again, most of us have never lived through a fixed exchange rate system. There's different ins and outs. I tried to strip them out so we don't get too technical. I could explain them if people want to know. But that's the concept. And if we move to that, and if we can get people in the bricks, and don't forget Sergei Glazyev, has the, and he's one of the key movers in all of this. He's a Russian economist, um, and he's the chief uh, uh, person for uh, at the um, European Economic, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union. 
but he works with bricks. He works with a whole range of things. He has himself, when, in a beautiful letter he wrote when Lyndon LaRouche died, it basically saying, I have learned much of my economics from Lyndon LaRouche. We are in the pipeline on that as well. Great. Well, thank you, Rich. And now I'm going to ask Jose if he can bring everybody up here, uh, because what I'd like to do is see if Sam and Simon have thoughts or questions or comments on anything that you've presented, because I imagine people listening will have some of those same uh, concerns or questions. So, Sam, it looks like you're here. Maybe you should go ahead and don't forget to unmute yourself. Yes, hello. So the idea of economics and the idea of trade, if I have this right, is to seek to uh, bring about a continuously growing relative population density then. And, yes. and uh, so to start off with, in the paper, Lyndon LaRouche uh, writes about a period of economic growth in 1945 to 1965, uh, I think brought about by the Bretton Woods system then. How would that compare to the trade without currency that you just described? Yes, it, in, in 1944, July 2nd through July 19th, um, 1944, in a town in New Hampshire called Bretton Woods, which is where the name comes from, at a particular hotel in that town, LaRouche grew up in New Hampshire. Um, but the thing is, the United States convened a group of countries. I think it was 43 countries. Uh, 19 of them were from Ibero-America because America had been already working with Brazil to develop Brazil and had ideas. We, we were already put, putting in tremendous hydroelectric processes. We were talking about building railroads there. We built the largest steel plant in the entire North American, South American, uh, our whole hemisphere in Brazil at Volta Redonda outside the United States. It was We did it because we were trying to industrialize Brazil and we were demonstrating to ourselves the same principle. So what was proposed there was the first Bretton Woods system. And the idea was to have credit issued by two institutions, largely one called the World Bank, but its official name is International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Europe was shattered, so it had to be reconstructed. The, the, the rest of the world was mostly colonial, still imperialist. They had to be freed, so it was development. International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And it was to put money in, as it says in its own statement, to raise productivity of labor. It's amazing to read an original document that puts that in there. But that's what Roosevelt was thinking. And so he then set out to make this a system. One of the greatest tragedies is he died on April 12, 1945. He was only 63 years old. Uh, and it was a loss in many respects. So the system got not what he fully wanted. Nonetheless, out of that, the United States, and LaRouche says this in the paper, uh, Sam, the United States put a lot of money into something called the Marshall Plan. And there's a lot of different things said about the Marshall Plan. I've actually read its documents. It put $12 billion of what are called concession loans, no interest, no principal, to Germany, France, and Italy in particular. Why? Because they knew from Versailles of 1919, when Germany was loaded up with debt, that that was a disaster. So you give something completely, you just give them the credit. And then the three billion in other forms. So that's 15 billion. Yeah, now you might say that's kind of small, but if you bring it up to dollars of today, it's about $240 billion. So that's a lot of money. That's a quarter of a trillion dollars. And I won't go through all the technical features by which it did it through a, a bank in Germany that was set up called the Credit Anstalt für Wiederaufbau. But the United States 
help those three countries, especially electrifying France and electrifying Italy and so forth. So as a result of that and developing Germany, the German economic miracle, of course, Germany, France and Italy did their part, too. They have a real tradition. But the point was that the United States consciously did this. It's not such a good side to the uh, um, Marshall Plan because there were people then who wanted to declare war on Russia. So there was a struggle between the New Deal element that was Roosevelt and the, that other element which wanted to destroy Russia. But the point of it is that as Germany, France, Italy, and all of Europe developed, and they exported to different parts of the world, including to Russia, you had growth. What Roosevelt would have achieved, probably not. But you had real growth. France and Germany had 30-year growth cycle. That's the economic miracle of Germany, and they call it the, the glorious years of France. And so LaRouche said, okay, we know this can work. And it was run through a dirigistic Hamiltonian bank. We know we can work. So what he says in the paper is, not that we toss out history, we look at what has succeeded and we build upon that, but we can't use the dollar and the gold reserve system. It's just not functioning because we've made the dollar so speculative and the whole finance, and it's been taken away from the sovereign control of the United States. You just can't go back. So you do what every creative artist always does. You say, let me recreate something else. Does that answer that? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Simon, do you have... Go ahead. Awesome. Okay, I hope everyone can hear me. I know I'm not dressed as well as everyone else <laughs> here at work, uh, but I, I'm, I'm going to try my best to ask a, a good question here. Um, my, main, my main question relates to Hamiltonian credit system because... Uh, in a section talking about the basket of hard commodities, uh, I think that Lyndon makes it very clear what he's talking about. He says that, in short, sound economic economics premises its me measurements of performance upon growth rates measured in physical units per capita and per square kilometer, not upon nominal financial prices attached to a list of produced goods. And I think that 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 really gets at the core of how he relates the Hamiltonian national banking uh, to this whole thing because he does talk about, uh, as you talked about in the basket of hard commodities section just uh, prior to this, uh, this questioning period, he talks about how Hamilton based his economic policies on uh, the United States and the mutual growth of urban industries and the rural countryside, which would be, uh, you know, two of those basket or two of those, uh, those, uh, you know, economic measurements that you measured mentioned earlier. And so my main question is then where does Hamilton's credit line and credit system and his form of national banking that includes Hamiltonian credit, uh, where does that come into the picture uh, as far as the basket of hard commodities is concerned? Excellent. Well, you use that principle and, and I just want to reference this and you may have been with us last night as well. I mean, Hamilton was very much influenced by Leibniz. Most of the American founders were influenced by Leibniz. He is the co-founder of America. And when I say co-founder, I don't mean like that's a to de de denigrate his role. That's to elevate his role, because most people have no idea who Leibniz is, nor that he played such a role. He had an influence on Franklin. He had an influence on Hamilton through a fellow named uh, Emmerich Fatel. But the key thing was, what do you do? And you're absolutely right about worthless values. You look at it says, what will increase by doing these baskets of household market baskets, industrial market baskets, and infrastructural market baskets, and then you sort of abstract from them a synthetic value for all three. The key thing is not just the size. In other words, in that case, America, like, for example, we have the most nuclear power plants in the world. We used to have 114. We now have 93. Um, so you can see we're dropping. China's going to build 50 in the next 10 years, according to their plans. So you have to look at the rates of change, Simon. In other words, it's not just how large it is, but how fast, and that's a second question, is the progression 
is the growth going on? And you have to try and figure this in when you're evaluating what you're going to make the synthetic unit of the, what you consider the total productive power of a country uh, equal to. China has now about 32,000 kilometers of high-speed rail. America, you can count it on one hand, and it's that. We don't, unless you want to consider the Penn Central, which doesn't go more than 125 on the Excella, which is not high-speed rail. So then you have to also look at the rate. Egypt. Egypt is building the El Daba nuclear power plants, four units that the Russians are building, just like they're building in Turkey. And they, op they opened up one, the Akayu, just uh, an official ceremony yesterday. Egypt is building a new administrative city. They're building a high-speed rail line in the north. So then how do you take that into account? Well, it's growth per capita per square kilometer. And it's the rate of growth. It's not just growth. And uh, same thing true with, by the way, on uh, uh, potential relative population density. It's not just that. It's the rate of growth of potential relative population density, which LaRouche says depends on volcanoes. And what does he mean? Scientific discoveries, creative discoveries. It's the rate at which you set up a society, which is why producing the young is so important, to make that rate occur, measured per square kilometer and per as per per uh, or per square mile in America and um, and per per uh, land area. But Hamilton's idea is that you direct credit. Credit is not just thrown out as it is today. Any bank can come along, and we see how well they are doing with their plans uh, right now. You know, Silicon Valley Bank down, Signature Bank down, First Republic Bank about to go down. So you direct it. You say, we'll give you credit. And how's it work? You say, okay, we're going to give you 2% credit. Simple, meaning it doesn't compound. If compounded credit, if, let's say you borrow 10%. If you borrow $1,000 at 10%. So after one year, you have now got $100 of interest. So that's $1,100 of, of, of um, you owe. And then if you don't pay it the second year, then it's $1,221 you owe. Simple interest, you never compound. And you make it 1% to 3% because you just want to cover the administrative cost of running a bank. And there are costs, so you make it 1% to 3%, 1% to 2%, 1% to 3%. And the federal government lends this credit. And there's two other sources. If it lends credit into a production process, then the company... Let's say the United States government has a third national bank. We nationalize the Federal Reserve. Excellent idea. And we go and the company says, okay, look, I've got a commitment from the National Bank of the United States for half of my lending. You, my local bank in, in Utah or local bank in Kansas or wherever, you meet the other half. Why is it sound to lend to me? Well, the federal government's lending half of it. And maybe they'll lend at 3%. Or three and a half percent. So you get a blended interest rate of maybe two percent. Then, especially in developing countries, you have a Hamiltonian international bank, which is what the what the Bretton Woods system was. It was directed credit. It wasn't just being dished out. And if you have it for speculation, sorry, Charlie, you go out and get your money from you know whoever you want to borrow from the local loan shark. You want to pay twenty five percent to speculate. That's what you'll pay. But if you want money from us, then you can get that. So you have an international Hamiltonian bank. Each country has its own Hamiltonian bank. And you discipline, and I use that word advisedly, it doesn't mean standing over a whip, but it means telling these banks through Glass-Steagall, these are your practices. You want to stay in business, these are your practices, because we're not going to go through one crash after another. That supplies a tremendous source of credit. And if you put your tax code that way, if someone buys new plant and equipment, they get a tax break. If someone hires more skilled workers, they get a tax break. So your tax code is set that way. If you do that, and if every country is doing that, then you have that per capita growth and the growth rates. So Perfect. Rich, <laughs> thanks. There's some questions coming in and also um I have a few thoughts, but I'll I'll wait on that. Um, 
one question is digital currency. A lot of people are very alarmed about this central bank digital currency being proposed here. How does that affect things? Um, also, you might want to say something about crypto, the alleged the fraud of the alleged independence of people going into various forms of cryptocurrency. Um, and then uh, also, I think it would be useful to discuss what you mean when you say we destroyed the dollar. How did that? I mean, I know one obvious thing, which is the decoupling from the gold reserve, but obviously is much more than that. Uh, clearly, there's not the so-called petrodollar seems to rapidly be becoming a thing of the past with recent developments. Um, so all of these things, I'd be curious. And also, Simon and Sam, if you have more to add in as Rich goes on, please just raise your hand or do something and we can bring you in. Go ahead, but, Rich. But keep both hands on that steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> but de definitely jump in. Just jump in and say what you think. Let me take the last question um, first, because it is a question of sovereignty. Crypto should just not exist. It's not a currency. It doesn't buy anything. It's not investable. You don't lend it. It's a you, you create something, you give it an artificial price. People run to buy it. And by running to buy it, it becomes worth more. They set their own price for these things. And it's based on blockchain, which can be useful, but the, it's it's an insane idea. We're gonna and it's sold to people. I'll say how, but but let's take the question of how the dollar was under this Bretton Woods system, even as it existed in its earlier stages. People don't remember this, and some are not old enough to remember it, so you can't blame it on their memory. Um, Marsha Mary Baker told me that when she wanted to go to Europe in the 1950s, she was allowed to take a hundred or hundred fifty dollars. You could not take more than that out of the country. Now, you could negotiate. If you were business, obviously, that's different. But if you were a tourist, you couldn't. Banks, if you wanted to get a dollar loan, could only be done from a bank domiciled in the U.S. Now, Luxembourg broke this in 1968, and Luxembourg and Switzerland are really offshore operations. They have a very useful side, but they have a very filthy side, which is one of the reasons I think also that there was so much effort to bail out Credit Suisse and Union Bank of Switzerland, because that's very useful to the offshore uh, bank tax havens and uh, drug money. But the point is, you could not issue a bank, an American bank in Europe couldn't issue money from the European side. It had to issue from the United States. What the petrodollar did is it broke that. And it said, now we can issue dollars because we're issuing them tied to oil, we will issue them from Europe. We had sovereignty, you couldn't do that. And then it doesn't have to be Americans that do it, it the British can do it, and they did it in a massive way. So the first phase of this was just letting this petrodollar de-dollarize the dollar. By de-dollarize, I mean we took away sovereign control. The second phase of that taking away of sovereign control was the taking the dollar off the gold reserve system. And the, the reserve system is different than the gold standard. It's a gold reserve system. And that was done in 1971. One of the problems was that the dollar was convertible to gold. And therefore, the French and the British in 1967, 68, and then again in 71, kept saying, we will bring our dollars over to you because it's convertible. You have to give us gold. And it was draining down the American gold supply. The British were doing this deliberately. The third thing we did is in 1979, um, there was a policy that was called controlled disintegration of the economy. There's lots of ins and outs. There's books on this. But Paul Volcker, who became Federal Reserve Board Chairman in 79, had said in 1978, controlled disintegration is a legitimate objective for the economy. What did it do? He took interest rates, which were high in October of 79, from about 9%, 9.5%. And by December of 1980, uh, they were 21.5%. Industry just collapsed, not just here, but all around the world. And when you have 21.5% of interest rates, the third world, this was a disaster. Because if it was compounded for three or four years, they their debt doubled. And they didn't do anything to make it double. And yet we always talk about those 
irresponsible nations in Iberoamerica. It's it's such racist garbage. But the point is, we brought down our economy, and we had pictures on EIR of smokestacks, steel smokestacks, being blown up. And the Chinese came in and bought some of our steelmaking capacity because we were blowing it up. We shut down auto factories. We shut down machine tool factories. Now that weakens your currency. And then we ran these huge deficits, both for the wars, uh, Vietnam's the first start, but otherwise and so on. And then lastly, I would say, and this has all sorts of things before we took ourselves off glass steagall the St. Germain Garn uh, deregulation of the banking, the first phase of deregulation of the banking in 1981 through a series of measures, we then more and more took ourselves away from a real economy. Now, what do we mean by that? If you put a dollar into the U.S. economy, there's about an 85 to 90 percent chance, like a, you know, a river system, that it will flow into speculation. It's the way it's set up. That's why we have to get rid of that. It doesn't matter what you want to do. It, that's where it will end up. So by the time that the dollar became so speculative, at that phase, when we started to use it as a weapon against other people saying, well, you, who, countries who we've been very oppressive to for years and years and years. And we said, now you, you, if you use the dollar, you have to dance to our tune in every power and policy. They said, this is insane. So it's been a progressive process of just destroying ourselves. That's what I meant by uh, destroying ourselves. As a quick answer, crypto has no function. Uh, I think we should ban derivatives. We don't need them. I think we should also probably pass a resolution that crypto should just be phased out. It drained out. People are told that crypto is great because the government, the man, doesn't want you to have it. And that's just playing on their very immature, you know, anti-government things. It has no purpose. As for digital currency, it could be useful. But the way I would say that it's being used right now, Diane, is it's being used that we will then have to go to the Federal Reserve for all credit and the Federal Reserve is a corrupt private bank. So I would say that digital currency can be useful. The Chinese use it in a limited way. If it was done in the same way, it could be helpful. But its purpose, as was set out four years ago in, um, in yeah, at the Kansas City Fed meeting in uh, Wyoming, I, I think it's suspect, but it can be used in a useful way. Simon, were you wanting to say something? No. Okay. Um, well, something uh, someone posted in the uh, chat about the question of, I think, potential population density, asking if you uh, divide the number of people in a country by the number of square miles to come up with a figure. I mean, I can say, it, it, see, it's very crude because obviously different kinds of land support different kinds of activity and you can make broad metrics, but just to give a sense, New Jersey was uh, the most densely populated state in the United States, probably still is at 1,200 people per square mile. I once just extrapolated that and found, I think it adds up to something like 4.6 billion people in the given land area of the United States. Now, does that mean that that's our potential population density? Well, not necessarily. In fact, I would say because of the collapse of the infrastructure we're experiencing, our own detonation, like here in New York, we shut down Indian Point Power Plant, and uh, we only replaced one of the plants. There were two reactors. Only one of them has been replaced in terms of production with a uh, natural gas-fired power plant. So when you lower energy, when you lower the things that sustain human life, then you're reducing the potential population density. And therefore, you know, you can't just extrapolate. It also leads to a kind of collapse. But what you see from all these people who claim the world is so overpopulated, overpopulated, and they're always naming some country in Africa or some other place, Many of the nations in Africa 
have three or four people per square mile, um, does it mean they can have more? It depends entirely on your level, on your platform of technology and development. But Richard, if you want to say anything more about that question, please go yes, ahead. Yes, and then Sam and, and Sam may want to say something too. Look, it, it's the it's the question of um, how you're viewing the future, because some people bring the past into their view of the future, and then say that's the future. We we are we have been collapsing in this America for thirty years. If you measure of a potential rel, oh, a potential relative population density. Diane just referenced one example. You could go across the country on this. The point is, human beings are the most beautiful species that we have. The most beautiful animals, species, some wonderful things. I love butterflies. I also like orchids. But human beings have powers that they don't. We can willfully change to move to a higher manifold, which no other species can do. Butterflies don't paint their own back. It, somebody did, but uh, or created them that way. Um, but the thing is, we could support in America if we develop nuclear power, fusion power, the North American Water and Power Alliance, a real space program, and the development of high-speed rail. We put two hundred billion into each of those, which over ten years, um, that would be a trillion over ten years, a hundred billion a year over once each year for 10 years. Money far better spent than bailing out First Republic Bank. Um, or in Ukraine. Or, or Ukraine, 112 you know, billion so far, and, and putting us on the edge of obliteration. If you did that, you would have not only cities which were more beautiful, if we built 10 to 12 new cities in Wyoming, Idaho, where they have populations of six, 11 and so forth per square mile. You would build cities, 12 to 15 new cities. You would have water through the North American water power lines. You would have high speed rail. You would have fusion. You could develop them like Florence. You could develop them like St. Augustine in the United States, which is a very beautiful city if you've ever been there, and make them beautiful and functional so that you don't feel crowded, so that a lot of the freight goes underground, as LaRouche said. You build a lot of those things. You take the trucks off the highway. We could support 500 billion people within, which would be a 47% increase from our 335 billion. And we would be living better with higher cognitive powers, with our youth making real discoveries and so forth. There's a prejudice against people. And it, and, and and you, Sam and Simon, grown up in this thing where you're told, why are you here? You're, you're consuming carbon. You're leaving carbon footprints. You're, you're using up air. It's a horrible conception. So what do we do? And in Africa, it's 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 they they have over fifty percent, no, about fifty percent, under thirty. Terrible? No, they're all potential geniuses. Make them geniuses and see what they could do. Think about it. If you had one person who could discover the cure for science, uh, cancer, that would be great. But if you have eight hundred, if you have eight billion people on this planet who could work on that and similar things, isn't that a benefit? Isn't population spreading the beautiful process of further growth, which we won't even be living here on this earth, or at least some of us won't for you know uh, a while? Sam and, and Simon, if you have children, they may be moon people, and they won't think of themselves as from the United States. They'll think of themselves as moon people because that's where they grew up. And we have the whole universe. We, as Lewis said, we could play ping pong with the stars. If you look at it that way, we don't have too many people. We have a huge deficit. So you may both have other thoughts on this. I ask you to both jo join in. What do you think? Good, Simon? please do. And because that we're going to need to conclude. So I would ask both Sam and Simon to say whatever you want to say <laughs> at this time. Who wants to go first? Well, it's certainly a really hopeful and beautiful idea, you know, the kind of the antonym to uh, a lot of, you know, despair that might be befalling some some people, you know, some, you know, populations. So we should seek anti-entropy. 
What would it do for Syria, Sam? Yeah, it would, it would flourish. Everywhere would flourish, wouldn't it? So, uh, I would invite Simon if he has anything to say. Sure. Um, I guess, uh, lastly, what I'll say is that uh, I just, uh, I think that really, if you look at how the universe works, and this is something that, I think this is mostly for people who maybe are not quite as familiar with like the technical fundamental understanding that you gain from, from reading the thousands and thousands of pages that LaRouche has to offer. But even intuitively, you can look at the nature of the world around you and you can understand there must be some higher principle of order that allows things to continue happening in the manner that they do. And in addition to that, what you find is that nothing ever stays the same. Nothing ever stagnates. Nothing ever just, uh, you know, stays there in a vacuum. Instead, things are constantly in this process of development and continually increasing and continually changing. And I, I'm more and more convinced both by the things that happen around me and by texts like Trade Without Currency and discussions like these that the, the truly characteristic uh, principle of the universe is anti-entropic. It is growth. It is this constant development that humans seem to have a unique impact upon. So uh, I'm very excited for this future in the same way that Sam is, and, and I'm sure everybody is. Well, we have to make that future. That's the, that's the obvious thing here. Uh, Richard, do you have anything you would like to say in closing before I wrap up? Um, I'm very happy to be on this with Sam and Simon because they represent the future and I think a really very good future on, on this conception. Thanks. What I would like to say is that um, I think we're going to have to take this up in another discussion. I've had a couple of symposia on the question of education and the question of the addiction of the social media. I know many of my viewers, when I was in the field in, in Manhattan yesterday, people are really distraught about the destruction of children in our public school system. And the obvious thing that people talk about is the sexualization of children. But one way of understanding how evil that is, is when you think about what children are not learning, that musical geniuses like Mozart and Beethoven were composing music when they were six years old. Why is that not expected of our children? If you look at the curriculum, I brought this up at the my town hall meeting that Alexander Hamilton proposed for students at West Point. Nowadays, people get triple PhDs and they don't know what Alexander Hamilton proposed that you should know at West Point. Children who are five and six year old, years old can play the piano, the violin. They can learn foreign languages. By the time they're 10 or 12, they could be fluent in three or four languages. It's when you consider what we are not giving to the next generation that you realize how we are destroying the future. We are totally destroying the future. And this can be reversed. I mean, that's the other beautiful thing about the human species. Human beings are uniquely capable of self-change. So it is not too late, even for those of us who are older than five or six or 20 or 40. Um, there are, <laughs> Richard says, go higher, 60, 70, or 90. Uh, we can learn a new language. You can change the way you think about something. And we're going to have to do a lot of that. We're going to have to create a, a revolution of the mind in this nation where people, and you could say go back to something as in the intent of our republic against imperialism, against the British Empire, but I would say further to go forward. And our constitution gives us that latitude because it says in order to form a more perfect union. 
which gives you the sense of a process which is open-ended, which is not ending, which is why we can have optimism. But uh, as I started, we are sitting here on the cusp of thermonuclear war, on the cusp of a blowout. We are actually in well along a blowout of the entire transatlantic monetary system. And every single person here has a critical role to play. So I think I will leave it at that. I'd like to thank everyone who listened, who put questions and comments in the chat and thank Simon and Sam and Richard Freeman for joining us. Good night, everybody. <laughs>